our facilitators for our workshop on equity. You know, uh, equity is a big thing with community colleges in the state of California. But at Merritt College, we've been looking at equity since 2006. So I want you to know the data that we provided to our facilitators came from the equity scorecard when we participated in that project. They got our uh, five-year annual report of student outcome data. And um, I can't remember the next report. They met with us on a couple of occasions. I was quite frank in my opinion when speaking with Lisa Lasky about brown black issues here at this campus, about race issues, about diversity, dialogue, and the need to have that. And what I said to her was, Merritt College, we, we always tell everybody we are the most diverse institution in the Bay Area. But we don't have diversity dialogues. Often we just take that diversity of perspectives for granted. But when we look at our student data and across equity and ethnic and racial breakdowns and see those students who are not succeeding, I think that sustains the, the, the need for us to have a continuous conversation about equity and race. And I think if you look at any news channel in America, you can see this conversation is needed even beyond merit. Um, I want to introduce Lisa M. Lasky, who is the Senior Director of the National Equity Project right here in our own backyard in Oakland, California. She's worked in education over 25 years as a teacher, leader, school and district coach, and has led several organization system change projects across the country. I'm not going to read her entire bio, because I know that she and Victor are going to tell, they're going to tell us what exactly the National Equity Project does, and a little more about themselves. We have Victor Carey, raise your hand here. He will be co-facilitating with Lisa. He's from the National Equity Project. Victor has worked in education in over 40 years, starting as a high school teacher in Richmond, California. And as the senior director of the National Equity Project, he leads the development. I thought this was interesting. He currently facilitates CHAOS, C-A-O-S, which stands for Complex Adaptive Oppressive Systems. Now, each of you were asked to read an article. Who read that article in advance? Yay, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Anne. Well, just in case you didn't, there's a copy on your table. And willing to be disturbed by Margaret J. Wheatley. I think we'll have an opportunity to review it. And I'm looking forward to the next couple of hours. And I want to welcome to our stage here, Lisa Lasky and Victor Carey. Give them a round merit. Oh. Thank you. Wow. Good morning, Merritt College. Good morning. Happy 2015. Um, I'm still reeling from that um, that singing, Dr. Trotter. I was I was sitting here thinking, what I, I'm not even going to try and top it. Um, but I will tell you, when I get a microphone in my hand, I I, I have a flashback to a recent bad karaoke experience that I had. It's very, uh, it was about a couple months ago. It had to do with me, probably on the wrong side of a couple too many beers and a very sad rendition of sitting on the dock of the bay. It was, a, it was the wrong choice for me. So I'll just leave you with that image um, and say to you all um, how honored and delighted um, we are to be standing before you today. Um, and very appreciative of the invitation to come to your flex day, and I'm excited now. I know that there's some possible Jamba Juice and Pete's Coffee in it for you. Um, uh, I will say in all seriousness, we stand here, my colleague Victor and I, before you today with great humility and respect for you. We are not here to um, pretend that we know something that you don't know um, or that we know your context better than you. Um, but we are here for a couple of hours 
to host and invite you into a conversation with each other about, quite simply, what matters most to you as faculty and staff of Merritt College. Okay? So, how's that sound? You, you wouldn't tell me. We don't know each other that well yet. Thank you, Dr. Trotter. All right. Uh, first of all, is that not a good looking breakfast up there? Isn't it? Um, and I appreciate the breakfast that you have supplied for us this morning. I want to start with this by inviting you to turn to a neighbor, one person, and say anything out loud to that person about what's on top for you right now. What's on top? What are you thinking of? What are you missing? What, what's on top? What are you thinking of? And when you see my hand go up, please stop. One, two, three, go. What's on top? All right, here we go. Thank you for that. I have something very important to tell you. But you have to listen. I want you to talk, actually. Here, uh, in the spirit of uh, full disclosure, I am a New Yorker. I'm just masquerading as a Californian. Thank you, sir. So I can talk faster and louder than pretty much any of you in this. That's a direct challenge. All right. I want to start with um, this notion by the same author, Margaret Wheatley, who wrote the article that we shared about this notion of community. And I just heard from your president that your focus areas are communication, trust, and community. So good for you. And we like this idea, because we believe that it's true. No power for change greater than this community together deciding what you care about and what matters most. For yourselves as colleagues, as professionals, as educators, and for your students. And guess what, you get to decide. And that is the only thing that compels people to change, to grow, to develop, if it's connected to something that matters. Um, I actually have been at this work for 30 some years, and um, believe me, I've done all the field research on this. You can't make people do stuff. I've tried every way. You cannot make them do stuff, especially when it comes to work around this notion of equity, right? You can support people's learning, growth, development, increased awareness, understanding, skill, knowledge, capacity, right? You're educators. You support that with your students all the time. You can do that. You can inspire, provoke, cajole. You can't make people do it, though. It's a choice, right? To which we'll demonstrate that to you in the next two hours. All right, does that look familiar to anybody? Good, I didn't make it up, I found it on your brochure. There's your mission. Excuse me? It's changed a little bit, okay. I like that one. Yeah, it's a good one. Two words were added. Two words were added, what are the words? In a global economy, okay. Yeah. In a democratic and global economy, right. In a democratic society and global economy. How about in this crazy world we're living in right in this moment? We are in a moment in time, are we not? Right, so our question to you all as educators and professionals supporting the learning, growth, and development of our young people, and in some cases, some of our most vulnerable young people, yes? What is ours to do in a moment such as this, as educators, right now? What is ours to do in a moment such as this? Think about that. So when you look at your mission statement, another question we have for you is, how's it going? How's that working? For whom? 
does it seem to be more realized? Who amongst your student body is furthest from realizing that? What do you understand about what's perhaps getting in the way or making it challenging for some of your students? All right. And seeing as that we're here on January 15th, I wanted to offer some words from the good Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Can you see that? Yeah. Hmm. Um, can I get a volunteer to read that out loud? We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you, Deborah. All right, there's your charge, right? So um, as Dr. Trotter said, she shared with us some of your data, some of your equity plan, a little history on where you are here. I heard um, the word sanction this morning. I know you're getting ready for um, a fairly high stakes visit and another quote unquote assessment, right? And here's what we would say to that. Plans, strategies, data, grants, programs, none of those things make change happen. People do. People make change happen, right? So as you uh, lean in, if you will, to some of, perhaps some of the gaps in the performance or in areas like uh, retention and course completion, some of those areas. How you understand what is happening there and how you talk about it together matters very much. Here we go with the communication, the trust, and the community. All right. All right. So here's some questions that we posed on your behalf and invite you to figure out where in your busy lives here, you actually take these up. I don't know if it's in your division structure or if there's other teams that you work on. Right. Actually, I didn't make this up. It came from some of your colleagues. How can you create an environment here that supports success for everyone, including you, especially you? Excuse me? Oh, you're gonna answer it, right on. First, you have to define success. Indeed. What's your shared understanding about what it really means, for real, to work towards equity, excellence and equity for all your students? Your shared understanding, because I would venture a bet that you are walking around with an understanding of how you think about that, this notion of equity. What's your shared notion of it? Because you're in this together, yes? That's good news, by the way. Here it comes, 10 o'clock, got to it. Where are the opportunities for you to interrogate the ways in which race, class, culture, language, experience, you can add a number of them in there. Influence, teaching, learning, leadership, decisions, relationships how you roll with each other. All of those things are at play, right? And what are the opportunities, because you have some, and some of the challenges that you've identified some, that you're currently facing and how do you talk about it? Right? Not to lay blame, Right? But to engage some multiple perspectives in thinking about that. Try some things. All right? 
And here's a gut question for y'all. What are you willing to do? Stop doing, start doing in service of those equity goals that you have articulated and somebody's gonna hold you accountable for them. What are you willing to do? That's a gut question, all right? So there you go. It just got really quiet. <laughs> all right. In the spirit of um, full disclosure, let me tell you who uh, you're standing with today. We are the National Equity Project, and I'd like to say we were in your neighborhood, but we're actually all the way down the hill in downtown Oakland. And we've been around for 20 years, in one form or other, mostly working in the K-12 education space, but in the last 10 years or so, um, working on both ends, too. Early learning, higher ed, in communities, um, with organizations who are serious about changing um, both the outcomes and experience for some of our most vulnerable young people and families. And without apology, we name who they are, at least inside of our education system. Black, brown, poor, and immigrant children and families. So that's who we're talking about. That's not to say that there aren't white families struggling in our schools, right? But I get to go, I get to travel from California to New York, and I'll tell you this, I see the same patterns of both underachievement and experience in our schools and communities. Whether they are low-income communities, middle-class, high-income communities, there are patterns to the experience and the outcomes for students and families in our systems. And those patterns are racialized, okay? All right, so we're trying to, we're saying, well, what's up with that? It's not that there aren't good, smart people, caring people out there. What's getting in the way of us educating all of our young people fairly, equitably, with care, with success? There are some things that are getting in the way. Okay, all right. So here's our charge. We're trying to deliver on the promise of a quality education for every, each and every young person in our schools and our systems. That's a promise that this country has made. We're trying to help people deliver on that. We are a social enterprise, nonprofit organization, and we're committed to those things. Supporting leadership and organizational capacity to get busy at the goals and deliver on your promise. As I see it, that mission statement, that's your promise to your students. That's what you're promising them. You come here, that's what we're working towards, right? Your job is to deliver on that promise. Part of the work is to have conversations all along the way about how we do it with that. Who's furthest from that reality? Why? What are we gonna do about that? Right? By the way, we are not in the business of blaming, shaming, or outing people. Again, I've tried all those strategies over the years, not particularly effective. We're in Oakland, we work in about six or seven states across the country, and all up and down California. And the National Equity Project is a collection of us, me and my colleagues, we've been working together for, um, as I said, around 20 years. But we're not a place as much as we are an idea. An idea about what's possible if we get organized and increase the will, skill, knowledge, and capacity to make good on our promises to our young people and families. That's the idea. So we're offering the idea to you today and uh, inviting you to think about it. All right. Do that. And part of our work, um, much of our work, is to support people to align what they want to be true and the actions they take and the conditions they create in order for that to happen. In many cases, again, we're not blaming, but we're a little out of alignment. We got grand visions and lots of of goals for our young people and families. 
Yet when, in some ways, inside of our institutions and systems, we're not set up to deliver on that, right? This is a design issue in many cases, not a people issue. Right? Yes, sir. This is a people issue. You've been talking for 20 minutes. You couldn't tell if we were awake or asleep. Couldn't tell if in fact we were hearing it. But you can tell that we hope you go away and not talk about this. I think that's the elephant in the room. We don't talk about it. And we tend to, in fact, let it be. And because this country is very phenomenal. We all believe the same things. Doesn't matter what you are, you believe the same sort of assumptions, we in fact just accept what it is. And so there has to be a better way to approach what is in terms of outcome for students, for faculty, and for the future of the institution. I, I uh, respectfully agree with you, sir. Except for the part where I, you're right, I didn't catch that you're wishing that I go away after 20 minutes. So I hope that's not true. Um, and uh, our, our uh, work uh, is actually testimony to um, the fact that there is another way to work towards equity in our systems and institutions. And it involves the people parts, and it involves the structures and the systems and the way we're set up, all different levels. And the work has to happen on all of those levels at the same time. Right? I mentioned racialized outcomes earlier. We get racialized outcomes in our schools and systems. Yes, you have them here. Right? Racialized outcomes do not require racist actors. How about that? We are getting those outcomes not only because we got a bunch of racists running around out there. Right? This requires, we would argue, and posit to you, a structural and systems analysis about how we are, our institutions, our very institutions are set up and run. And yes, people have a lot of learning to do. They have a lot of learning and healing to do. Yes, ma'am. To echo the idea that it's, we don't talk about the issues. We just kind of talk about race and oppression, and we haven't, it's been a while. I think we had a, a, a panel quite a few years ago, and it was an attempt to begin that dialogue, and it just never grew into anything. Thank you for that. All right, well, let's talk about the issues, Sally. Because we believe both the problems and the issues and the solutions reside here. There isn't another set of people that are come, gonna come in and do that to you or for you or provide you with that. You already have the juice that you need. Just need to get arranged in such a way that you can lean into that together. And you can put out those provocations, sir, and ask people if they agree with you or not. Somebody else might have a different idea about that. Which one of the reasons people don't jump up in a room full of however many people are here and start engaging that conversation is because they're not maybe sure how that would go down or what would be the repercussions of that. Or the last time they did that, it didn't work out so well for them. Right? So people have had real experiences in these kind of conversations. I want to offer this set of ideas about having deep conversations. And they really could serve 
as sort of ground rules um, for you. So put your eyes on that. Yeah, the art of conversation. It's on your table. Yeah, thank you. They're all over the room. Thank you. Anybody need them? agreeing to these ideas, right? What would be most helpful for your participation of that? And just think about that. Because part of the um, reason that people start a quote unquote equity conversation or a conversation about race and it kind of drifts away or you don't get back to it is because there are not explicit ground rules for how we're going to do that. And so this is just a, it's an offering. You can take it or not. Okay? But, but believing and acknowledging that we're coming to this as equals, people have their own experience, ideas, perspectives. Everybody is an expert in their own experience, and people's experience is not up for debate. Right? Of their experience, right? So here's one that I think might be hard for you all, I'm gonna guess. The old slow down, so we have time to think and reflect. Requires a little bit of slow down like you're doing this morning. And that could feel excruciating to busy people because you're like, oh, when do we get on to the important work of looking at our data or getting our budget done, right? Yes, sir. I appreciate the art of conversation. I think for me, when I hear the conversation around equity, it's exciting because I feel like it's something that needs to be addressed. But I think my concern is where does the conversation start? Because you can start with our students in our classrooms. We have faculty, we have admin. Where does the conversation start? I think that for me is probably a good thing to address so we can know how we're going to have this conversation. That's a good segue to the distinguished gentleman to your left um, to get up because he's going to get us started. On. Thank you for that. Good morning. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Victor Carey, and uh, I've been reflecting all morning. It was like I had this moment when I came up on the Merritt College campus um, because um, I haven't been up here in a very, very long time. And the um, reason I'm mentioning is that when I graduated high school. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And so um, I started my post-secondary career at a community college. Not in the East Bay, I have to be in San Francisco, so I'm in San Francisco City. So and I don't know what the attitude about that would be. But um, it was uh, a really important start for me. Um, and you know, you all are in the news today. Uh, did you know that? Yeah. Who, and, what do you think I'm referencing? Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks, right. Graduate of Skyline High School, who, and I, don't, I knew that, but I didn't know that he started his, you know, journey, really, at the community college, show up in the And what else is the news about you all? Yes, he's, he's saying, he's bringing it back, he's saying, um, get more folks into community college at no cost. Crazy idea. Crazy idea. So, um, so I come to you really um, excited about the possibility you represent for young people. Um, uh, from my own personal experience and in the years I've been in education, knowing the critical role community college plays. Also, when I look around the room and I see the level of diversity in the room, I, I, it kind of takes my breath away because trust me, I've been in a lot of places where uh, not so much, not so much. Um, so the possibilities here are, are enormous. Uh, but I've also heard some bubbling coming up uh, around, you know, like, why are we really having the conversation we need to have? You know, where did that conversation start? Um, 
And I'm sure you can add to the wonderings about how to get into this for real. Right? Uh, we're here for just a little bit of time. Just a little bit of time. So our offerings are around mostly how to get started. Uh, or how to restart if you, if you had attempted before that maybe, maybe had not gone the way you might have hoped. Um, so we're asked all the time, well, how do you get started on a conversation about equity? Because it can feel uh, messy. It can feel emotional. Um, and it certainly can feel confusing. Um, and so what we say, that the way to get started is literally by slowing down enough to listen to each other. And that may seem like a very trivial matter to slow down and to actually listen. But actually, it's the way in. And we have substantial evidence from our own experience in this work. That's the place to start. And it doesn't matter if it's in a, uh, uh, with a group of folks who are working with um, um, in early learning and they're trying to figure out how to get a child kindergarten ready, or if it's with uh, high school faculty who are trying to figure out how to close the, not the achievement gap, but the opportunity gap in their institution. Or perhaps here at a community college where you're trying to figure out not only how to retain your kids, but how to transfer them into a four-year institution or perhaps into a, a, a career that has some longevity. Uh, for myself, that was a big deal. I was able to start in a community college transfer to uh, UC Berkeley and do graduate work at Stanford. But it all started at community college. So I appreciate the possibilities that is, that is you. So this notion of listening is not a trivial matter because it's the way in. So it's an offering. And the reason I'm so adamant about it, it's not, it's not just a thing. It's part of our theory of action about how to do work. And here's the thing about this. Oftentimes, getting conversations started and sustaining them is not random. It requires intention, rigor, discipline. Just like any other discipline. So we have a theory of action. That theory of action begins with listening. Oh, and I'll add to that leadership. In our work, we have a definition of leading for equity that simply says leading for equity means taking responsibility for what matters to you. So in that sense, everyone in this room can take this up and be a leader for equity in their own way, in their own space. Just imagine what that could look like if you harness that collectively in service of your young people who come up here with hopes and dreams about their future. Would someone read loud and proud? What's up on the screen right now? I believe we can change the world if we start listening to one another again. Simple, honest, human conversation, not meditation, negotiation, problem solving, debate, or public meetings. Simple, truthful conversations where we have a chance to speak, we each feel heard, and we each listen well. We Margaret, she's been on this subject. It's so interesting about Margaret Wheatley's work. She's in really, uh, is uh, started a career as a chemist, and then he got into organizational development. So, uh, and she writes beautifully, but, but she, she knows some things about the notion of living systems and, and what it takes to engage with each other. And she has, a, and she's offered us some real good insights into the notion of beginning to listen to each other. Because it's the most basic human way to connect, giving time to actually give it attention to a colleague. So think about it for a moment. Giving attention to each other in ways that support meaning making, sense making about the things that matter to you. Doing that for real. Not in the pretense that we often have in public spaces where we listen perfunctionally, but actually listen with some integrity, with some attention to another person, what they care about. That might, that might sound soft. But when you think about the conversation you aspire to have, which is some of the challenges that have been persistent, as I understand, here around 
equity and how it manifests, or inequity and how it manifests. How do you think you get into that? We believe you get into that by giving some serious attention to what, what's on people's minds and listening with some attention and respect to what people have to say. Challenge is, we're not always the best listeners in the world. There's some data about that. 80% of the way time is spent communicating. We spend about 45% of the way time listening. The question is, what's the quality of that listening? 75% of the words are ignored, misunderstood, or forgotten. And in most of us, this is actively for about 17 seconds. So I've already lost you. That's all right, I really need to talk to myself. It's all right. And this, um, this is data, and we've known this quite some time. This is a question, especially if, uh, as a leader, and I'm thinking about the folks in the room who are here today because you chose to come, um, and your colleagues who may not be here, how to bring them into the conversation. Um, and it begins with, Providing a little room to listen to them about why maybe we weren't able to come or, or opportunity to find out about um, what you'll be doing over the next couple of days. So, what kind of listener are you? Take a moment, think about the kind of listening you do. And here's some ways that we typically listen. There was a little giggle around that pretend list. We're really good at that, especially in public spaces. Oh, you want to add one? Please do. Impatient listening. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah in fact, you want to. Um, if uh, the form of listening comes to mind, give me a shout out. We had uh, impatient listening. Any other forms you think of? Selective listening? Okay, yes, yes sir. Dismissive. Ooh, dismissive listening. Oh. Interpretive. Interpretive listening. <laughs> All right then. Yes, sir. So there are many, many ways that we can listen. And again, not a judgment about it. We are human. This is kind of how. Uh, uh, listening could, can occur. But the thing about it is, every form of listening is not necessarily the most productive listening when you are grappling together to make sense around things in which there is no clear and apparent answer. Um, and certainly, when you talk about equity, and we will talk a little bit more about that this morning, um, there aren't immediate apparent answers to how you address equity issues that work for everyone. Um, so that means listening, how we listen. The quality of that listening is a powerful platform in which to build that common understanding about what matters to us and what kind of actions would move us forward in ways, move us forward together in ways that make a difference for your young people and for yourselves. So we're going to invite you into uh, Practice a little of a form of listening that we have found to be really helpful um, in getting conversations started and sustaining them, even when it gets messy sometimes. And sometimes this is called constructive listening. We need constructive listening today, um, just so that you can see that it's, uh, stru structure is your friend. You don't have to have personal power to get people to get engaged with each other. You have structure holds a community that can move a conversation forward and build it useful. And so this structure of listening is both a structure and a process that, that we found really helpful. And it's a really simple idea. I agree to listen to you in exchange for you listening to me. Yes, sir. So, there's some underlying assumptions about why inviting this form of listening can be helpful. 
first thing about it is, is that it's sort of in the front of the talk. So it's a little counterintuitive. Typically, when we're listening, we're listening for our own information. We're listening to win. We're listening to make someone else wrong. So listening for the benefit of the topic flips the script a little bit and it says, I'm going to give you attention for your benefit. Just that act alone makes a difference in a relationship. So it's one thing to talk about trust, it's another thing to have a practice that builds it. To have a practice that builds it. And why this is important, because we're thinking, feeling, human beings. So cognitive and affective processing always is going on. The question is, how do you privilege both things in a, in a way that kind of balances out our experience about what we're sitting in? So when people say that they're not in a safe place to have conversations about equity, it usually means that there's not room for affective processing to be available. So you're trying to work through the problem just with cognition, just with big ideas, but not necessarily the experience that are tied to those big ideas. This form of listening allows both things to be at play. And the value of that increases our understanding about what we care about, what we need to do together. And it goes back to this belief that we hold very deeply in our organization. People can solve their own problems. We never go out and say, we know the answer and we can help fix you. That doesn't work. It will never work. What works is people choosing in on their own volition and figuring out together what are they going to do about the things they care about. Nothing more, nothing less moves you down the road.